Okay, uh, so first off, um, just an apology. I had a bit of minor technical glitch. My laptop doesn't work with the projector. So um, I had a short introduction and a demo. Um, instead, what I'm going to do is try and extend the, the introduction. If you have any questions, feel free to interrupt, because then I can waffle on and actually make time. Um, <laughs> So yeah, um, my name is Daniel Hall. I work at realestate.com.au. At the moment, my focus is on getting a lot of our services into the cloud. So at the moment, I'm doing a lot of cloud formation. Um, we've just started using Ansible to deploy our uh, cloud formation machines. Um, yeah, that's me. Um, I recently wrote a book on Ansible called Ansible Configuration Management. At the end of the talk, I have a discount code if you want it. Um, so Vagrant. That is, really, that is really easy to do. Uh, <laughs> cool. Um, so Vagrant manages virtual machines for you. Basically, um, you have a file in whatever repo called a Vagrant file. Um, it tells, uh, and then you, know, you go into that folder and type Vagrant up. That tells Vagrant, that file tells Vagrant what, um, what base machine to use and then how to provision it. So you, you can choose from a variety of source control, uh, a variety of config management tools. Um, I prefer Ansible because it's simple, um, but you can use Puppet on it. Ansible is nice and easy because it doesn't require a server. You can just write your configs and just rapidly iterate. Um, as I said, Vagrant's easy to use. Once you've got either VirtualBox or VMware running, um, you can just configure, uh, you just install. Um, Vagrant, which comes as an RPM and a bunch of other um, styles. You can also gem install it. Um, and then, essentially, you tell, um, you type Vagrant up, and away it goes, generates your machine, sets the root password on it, configures it all, and then runs Ansible, which rolls out your configuration. Um, I did have nice code and demos, but that's not going to happen now. Um, it's really good, um, particularly for the developers that I'm looking after, that I can give them a machine, the base node, that it looks exactly like a production base node. So then when they're developing, they can go, once they've finished, run their tests, they can um, deploy it to their Vagrant environment and check that it actually is going to work the same way in production as it works in dev. Um, and for example, um, one thing that keeps getting us over and over, well, used to keep getting us over and over, was that MySQL on a um, OSX system isn't case sensitive if the file system isn't case sensitive for table names. Whereas now, because they're testing and their, their um, MySQL machines are running in their Vagrant virtual machines, it's actually case sensitive as exactly the way prod would be. Um, and yeah, as I said, you can add a Vagrant file uh, which is just named vagrant file in the root of the repo. Um, and you can actually have that in the source control along with the app. So as things change, you can change the base box or whatever that you use. Uh, so now to Ansible. Ansible is designed to be ra radically simple. Um, I haven't got an example of an Ansible config here, but it's basically just a YAML file. There's a few requirements and a little bit of stuff to get out of the way. And then you just write a whole lot of stuff that tells Ansible what modules to run and what commands. Um, it's really cool because it runs it in the exact order you specify. So you don't have to define dependencies. You can define them implicitly just by ordering your um, config. Um, and it doesn't require a server. So um, with Puppet and Chef, Generally, you don't have to, but uh, generally you set up a Puppet server, and then you have the node talk to that, crazy certificates, all that sort of stuff. Um, with Ansible, instead, it talks over SSH. It deploys a Python script into slash temp on that machine, and then it executes it. Um, and that does all the configuration of the machine. So essentially, you just need one machine to, that can SSH to the machine you need, which at my work, I just generally use my laptop, and I have my keys deployed. Um, but you could also have a shell box or something like that. Um, it also yeah, it doesn't require you to install anything on the managed node, except for things that you need for certain modules. So for example, if you're, um, 
if you're deploying, if you just need to run a command, basically you use the command module and just tell Ansible to go to that machine and run a command. Doesn't need to install anything on that machine, except for, of course, the command you're trying to run. Um, and Python, sorry, yes, correct. And if you're running an older version of Python, you need a Python module to do JSON processing. Um, yeah, um, it's designed obviously to be really simple and really easy to understand. And they recently added support for something called roles, which lets you segregate um, your Ansible configurations into functions, just like you do with Puppet modules. Um, why do we need these? Well, our old style of working used to be that you edit the Puppet configs, and then you do a Puppet dry run on one of the machines and check what it's going to do. And then if it works, you commit it from your branch into um, the master branch. The problem is, uh, dry run on Puppet and Chef and all those tools just basically outright lies. Um, <laughs> it, it tries its best, but there's certain things you can't do. If your test depends on an executable, it can't actually execute that statement for you because it's trying not to change anything. Um, and there's a dozen other stuff, a dozen other reasons why it wouldn't work. For example, if uh, with config management, when you're deploying a change, you're changing the system as you're um, going. And so as your um, config is running, changes are happening that are changing future outcomes. If you're running in dry run, unfortunately, it can't make those changes. So it doesn't affect later steps the way it should. And effectively, you don't see things that you would catch. Um, so the way to solve this, obviously, is to use Vagrant, um, which lets you actually have, you can spin up a machine, deploy the old version of the config, deploy the new version of the config, and see what changes were actually made, not what changes it thinks are going to be made. Um, obviously, that doesn't work for everything. Um, some things, you only, when it changes, you're only going to be able to test in your production environment unless you have an exact replica. Um, but the majority of changes we can make this way. And for us, it seems to be saving us a ton of work. Uh, and obviously, uh, because you can include your Vagrant file and your Vagrant configs. You can include this all. If you have an open source project, you can include this all in the repo. And if someone wants to check out um, your application, wants a demo version or something, they can base essentially just check out your repo, change into the repo directory, and type Vagrant up. Um, I'm a co-author on a, a software project called RadicDB, which is password management. Um, and you can effectively, if you want to test it, if you have Vagrant and VirtualBox installed, you can change into that directory, type Vagrant up, and it will go grab the ans uh, execute uh, Vagrant, install the box, start it up, grab your Ansible binary, run the Ansible configs, and uh, you should have a working demo machine with that one command, in theory. And uh, this is where the demo goes. There's no demo, sorry. And uh, unfortunately, that's all I have. So um, if you want to grab my book on Ansible Config Management, there's the thing there. That should scan from your phone, possibly. <laughs> um, yeah. Any questions? Yes. Yeah, so, um, sorry? Oh, repeat the question. So um, I was asked, how do I manage secrets like uh, keys and passwords? Um, the way we do it is we have a, a separate Git repo that only certain people have access to. Um, and Ansible lets you um, use external variables files. And we just point at those so that when we run in production, it pulls in all the right variables to actually deploy a production machine with production keys and passwords. Um, whereas when you run it in dev, it just uses the default variables in the config, which you know could be anything. Um, anything? Yes. Yep. So how do I cope with people who can't run VirtualBox for some reason? Um, so as far as I know, there's a plugin for VirtualBox, VMware, and KVM. Um, the KVM one isn't quite mature yet, but it's most of the way there. 
Um, generally, at our workplace, it's not a problem because everybody runs the same image. I, on Radic, we just assume we're running VirtualBox. Uh, I guess you can't really. The, one of the annoying things about Vagrant is that it, um, your configuration and what you use is written in the actual Vagrant file, which unfortunately means if, the, if, the, if your system's running something different, you can't just have it, the Vagrant file detect that and run something else. Um, so yeah, that's something I'd like to see change one day if some smart developer around here could fix that for me. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, yeah, I mean, Ansible will work with anything. Um, and I guess you could just still test the Ansible configs uh, against another machine that you've spun up yourself instead of having Vagrant spin it up for you. Oh, yes? Uh, ah, OK, yeah. Do you have any Ansible configuration that you can check? This is my laptop, uh, so no. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry? Uh, you, how much time have I got left? Plenty? Five minutes. Five minutes. If you want to run up here and plug your laptop in, you can show us. <laughs> uh, I do have a Git web interface, actually, but I just didn't want to do it because it's your laptop. I don't have anything to show. Oh, nice. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> So Ansible calls its uh, uh, configs playbooks. And here you can see a playbook that, uh, whoop, it's gone. So it, it looks like it's installing backup PC. Um, you can see at the top the host that it run on. So uh, Ansible will, uh, Ansible uses groups. And when you run a, a playbook like this, it checks the string in the host section and checks if it matches any groups. And if it does, it runs it on all those hosts. And then it checks if it matches a specific host. And if it does, it'll run it on just that host. Um, and you can see it needs to sudo on the machine. Um, it'll actually, you can actually configure Ansible to ask for your sudo password. So if you have keys to the machine, but you don't necessarily have sudo rights, and you need to sudo before you can do these changes, then you can actually have it SSH in with the keys and then ask your sudo password before it runs the stuff. Um, and then, yeah, up here we're running the at module. So you, name is just a decorative thing. Um, you can use it to refer to actions if you want to cancel them or, or uh, trigger other actions. Um, and you can see the at module, and we're installing a package, we're installing a bunch of packages. Um, which get put into the variable item. Um, and with items basically causes Ansible to loop over that and sub each one into the item variable up there. So that's what the curly braces mean. Um, and you can see it's been, this uh, action up here has also been tagged with the tag packages. Ansible lets you, when you're running your configurations, you can tell it that you only want to run actions tagged with a particular thing. Which is really handy if, you're, if you've got an Ansible config that can provision and deploy your app. Um, if you're just deploying a new version of the app and you know the machines are already provisioned, you can skip the, de the, deploy uh, the provisioning steps and just run the deploy steps by just telling it to run things tagged as deploy. Um, and then, you know, the same thing. So this cr the next uh, one creates a group for backup PC users. Um, and then make sure the backup PC user exists, and so on. So I could go on about it all day. <laughs> yeah. I have another question. Yeah, yeah. So the groups um, that must be defined somewhere. Yeah, so. Where are these groups' definitions stored? Um, you know, I'm just thinking I want to use this in conjunction with our existing configuration. Mm -hmm. already groups and So. So the question was, how does Ansible know about its groups, basically? Um, and Ansible pulls the groups from either an inventory file or an inventory script. Um, there's documentation on the website about how to write scripts that provide the inventory, or you can just write an any style file and define it. 
But um, I generally use inventory style scripts because then you can pull them from, say, EC2 or other places, like uh, a certain CMDB that we were just talking about. Um, and that lets your, your uh, Ansible configs. So, yeah. All you need to do is I'll put YAML like that. Yeah, so this is, this is an inventory file here that basically just defines it statically. But you can, ha you can write a oh, script. This is script output. Oh, sorry, this is the script. Um, but you, you can have Ansible run a script, and the output of that script defines the environment that Ansible is going to be running in, and it can then choose the, uh, the hosts based on searches through that. One minute. Last question. One minute. Last one. Nope. nope. Thank you very much.